right, welcome everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep, I'm Carla Murdoch. I'm director of the Mudd Center for Ethics. And I'd like to welcome you tonight, this afternoon, to the third lecture in our program this year about beneficence, practicing, and ethics of care. In September, our series was launched by the philosopher Karen Storr, who discussed Kantian perspectives of beneficence and values of love and respect. She addressed the importance of helping others on their terms, according to their goals, and in line with their dignity. In October, the clinical psychologist and neuroscientist Helen Wang discussed her research on the neurobiological mechanisms underlying compassion-based meditation. She described how her methods have enhanced equity and inclusion in this research literature in two ways. First, by incorporating diverse samples of meditation participants, and second, by using machine learning techniques to analyze meditation skills at a neural level within individuals' brains, instead of relying on average scores that fail to respect diversity in individual neural patterns. This afternoon, Professor Jerome Stewart will expand our consideration of beneficence by addressing how norms embedded in our educational structures may run counter to the value of beneficence and the practice of care. Next Wednesday, our fall term series will conclude with a lecture by the developmental scientist Megan Mueller, who will discuss how human-animal relationships might inform our practice of care. This event is co-sponsored by the WNL Museums and Library, and following the lecture, we'll enjoy a reception for the animal-themed museum menagerie exhibit in the Watson Galleries. Before tonight's lecture, I'd like for us to pause to appreciate the land that surrounds us and those who have cared for it for centuries, the Yisa and their descendants, the Monacan people. In accepting the privilege of dwelling on this land, we're called upon to be curious and proactive in learning its full story. We're called upon to work toward understanding a larger context for this land that our lesser selves might ignore. Luckily, WNL's Native American Student Organization and other sponsors are making it really easy for us to learn more about this story. So you're invited to join in a community meal and talk by Victoria Ferguson on November 14th in Evans Hall. The organizers ask that you register to participate using a QR code by Monday, November 7th. And Kate has some handouts about this that she's gonna pass down the rows so you can um, get, get access to that QR code tonight if you're interested. So with that, I'm delighted to introduce you to Professor Jerome Stewart. He's an assistant professor of management at the College of Charleston. His research and teaching address power within organizations and how to create more equitable and cooperative power structures. His recent work has focused on corporate misconduct, discrimination in higher education, and critical business pedagogy. Professor Stewart has been recognized globally for his teaching innovation. Most recently, among other many awards, he was awarded the prestigious Ideas Worth Teaching Award from the Aspen Institute Business and Society Program. Among other innovations, he's integrated art making into business courses that foster critical reflection of social structures and norms. Professor Stewart earned a BA in Finance and African American Studies from the University of Minnesota and a PhD from the University of North Carolina Charlotte's Interdisciplinary Organizational Science Program. So Professor Stewart, welcome. Thank you, Carla. Okay, thank you so much. Carla, can everybody hear me? Okay, I'm gonna set this phone right here so that I can periodically check myself. Um, let's set that there. Oh, all right, uh, I'm gonna do a lot of wandering, but I'm gonna start here. Did you turn this off, Carla? Yes. Okay, good. I'm gonna start here. I'm going to do a lot of wandering. Um, 
I really appreciate this this opportunity from from Carla and, and the Mud Center, but also just from from WNL more broadly. All the things that you all love about this university, I don't think you should take that for granted. It is not like this everywhere. There are a lot of special things to this university, and I've been here. I don't have a watch on. A handful of hours, um, just a day. Uh, but you all have got a special thing going on here. I don't think you should take that for granted. It's really cool. So I really appreciated being here. It's given me a lot of perspective. Uh, and I hope that I can give you all some perspective now. So uh, I've never had a screen this big. This is, huge. this is huge. We'll see how that goes. We'll see how that goes. All right, let's, let's bring this here. Is that going to turn that on? Okay, that's all right, I can, ah, here we go. All right, so I want to start by uh, giving us all some perspective. These are my dogs. At the top is Shonuff, the Shogun of Harlem. Raise your hand if that name means anything to you, if you know where that comes from. That's okay, I didn't feel it. Anybody ever seen The Last Dragon? All right, we got four people. So for those of you virtual, four people. All right, so let me come back to that. Let me come back to that. Showing up the Shogun uh, from The Last Dragon. Down here, we've got Asada Shakur, A-S-S-A-T-A -S -S -A -A, Shakur. Raise your hand if that rings a bell. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, so a couple more. Seven out of however many. Um, all right, so, so these are my two dogs. And um, I got shown off seven years ago. I got Asada almost six years ago. And both of these dogs were uh, lost causes. Nope, a little too close to home. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> See what I did there? OK, both of, the <laughs> both of these dogs. Um, the SPCA had kind of deemed them sort of beyond um, repair. And so the SPCA took both of these dogs from other um, uh, dog rescue spots where they were going to be euthanized and said, this is their last chance. So I went in there first, and I said, give me your worst dog. And, and they gave me show enough. And they said, he's just, he'll never be able to be around other dogs. He's just way too aggr aggressive, and he's, and he's just a mean dog. He's just something in his spirit. I remember they said that word to me, something in his spirit. Um, I came back a year later, and I had him in tow, and I said, where's your worst dog? And they had one that was a, a huge dog. I said, I just really don't want a big dog. Um, there's, there's one part of having a big dog I'm not interested in, and that's something you do a couple times a day with the plastic bag. I said, I, just, I really want a little bit of a smaller dog. And so they said, well, we've got one. Um, there's no way she's going to get along with Show Enough. We remember Show Enough. This dog is even worse. Show Enough had terrible... Um, aggression towards other animals, and she's already bitten three humans. She doesn't stand, uh, she can't stand dogs, she can't stand humans. It's not going to work. I said, oh, that's cool. Um, all right, so we bring Show Enough in here, and we, and we brought Asadi in, and magically they coexisted. They got along from the jump. And I'm telling you this as just a way to change our minds uh, and start this talk with the assumption that our realities are not always what they think. We can always reimagine things to be something other than what they currently are if only we take the time and investment. All I did was give these dogs intense love. That's the word I deliberately used. I gave them intense love. Now, I bring these dogs into my classes um, usually at the end of the semester, and I, I forgot to do it if some of my students are listening. I'm sorry, y'all. I'll, I'll bring them at the end of the semester and make up for this. But I often talk about these dogs at the beginning of the semester to talk to them about the importance of love. And I'm talking about in like a business strategy class. The idea behind this is to train their minds to examine our assumptions and uh, really understand that reimagining everything that we think is set in concrete is possible, if only we take the time to do so. 
So that's what I want us to do here today, is to really take the opportunity to rethink some of the things we already know. All right, so um, my research generally exists. Carla did a great job of talking about some of my boring research. Um, my research generally exists in this circle on these three topics. What I'm going to do is focus on something that I thought was pretty accessible, and I spent some time thinking about how can I bring it out of the academic clouds that we're usually in and just make this accessible for all of us. Um, so can I, let me see, uh, can I get a show of hands? How many students who are, wait, 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 students who are, students who consider themselves business students, not necessarily major, but who considers themselves a business student? It's okay, I'm not gonna call on you, just show of hands. You can raise it, yeah, you can raise it. One, two, three. Most of you. Oh, okay, I like that, all right. Um, how many faculty who are in here would consider themselves uh, a business faculty? Oh, so we got a good amount of you all. Okay, all right. That's helpful to know. Um, what I'm going to focus on is something at the combination of these bottom two. Um, is there a, oh, there's a thing here. These bottom two boxes here. We're going to reimagine the business school and then at some point take a, a particular dive into this idea of strategic diversity and how business schools communicate um, and value ideas around diversity. And I use that word you know, kind of loosely. All right, so here's the sort of the title, and we've already talked about it, you've seen it, no need to repeat it. Um, the key in this for us for the next 30 minutes or so is considering this idea of competitive individualism and its harm. Now I'm taking as an assumption, and I'm not gonna talk a lot about um, the idea of beneficence and care, as one of our ultimate goals because that's kind of what this is all about. So I'm speaking sort of in uh, ideas that are contrary, that are, that are not aligned with this idea of beneficence and care. Um, so I'm just kind of taking that as a, as a given. All right, talk a little bit about motivation and background. Let's see, so um, I published a paper here this first one here, some of, I talked with you, uh, or some of you earlier today about this. And this is a publication based on this um, project that I created with my students, this art project. And I put this up here because the first time I presented this at a conference, I went to the conference, it was a business conference, um, uh, it was a management conference and this was a business ethics theme, uh, track they might call it. So these were business ethicists in the room. And after my presentation, they had two questions for me that kind of, uh, yeah, I would say two questions. The first was, in creating an art project for my students, how can I possibly give them a grade for that? Faculty were really, really concerned with how I was gonna grade students. And I kept asking, why, well, why does that matter? Why do you wanna grade them? And then a second question emerged, and this was multiple attendees. How are students gonna be able to know if they're art is good. You've got to give them a grade. How would they know if it's good? Um, I'll just let you sit with that for a moment. Uh, that's what initially started getting me to think a little bit about this competitive individualism. And then I did another paper um, with colleagues that, that's under review now. And in this paper, we began to uncover in business schools the individual level focus on student mental health and well-being. Um, for the faculty and staff, you know that there's an increased emphasis in the, in the past, what, five, ten years on student mental health and well-being because we know um, student mental health challenges are on the rise. So because they're on the rise, we've given this a lot of emphasis uh, at our universities. In the business school, that emphasis has overwhelmingly been at the individual level. That is, students, it's your responsibility to demonstrate greater grit, greater resilience, go to a couple of workshops on resilience, read a book on grit. You've got to overcome these hurdles. That's been the overwhelming message in business schools. And we, we wrote this paper as just a sort of a nod to the systemic challenges that exist for students um, and, and to just help push us away from this individual level um, understanding of, of mental health challenges. So that was that. Um, and then at, after the, the murder of George Floyd happened, um, we can see, and I assume most of you know where this is, just not, not too far down the road. Um, 
After the murder of George Floyd, business schools pretty uniformly came out with statements that, call me naive, I actually thought they were pretty genuine. Business schools cared about, about um, uh, black lives and cared about issues of racial justice. But I wasn't sure why. Towards what end? Why does this matter to you? And I started asking those questions, and that's when I, again, went down this path and started to learn about competitive individualism. So um, the lens that I take to study this idea of competitive individualism, this is the lens I take when I'm teaching. This is the lens I take in my research. Um, this is the lens that I really ask my students to, to prioritize, um, is what I call this liberatory consciousness lens. Now, this is an idea that comes from Paulo Freire's idea of conscientization. I can't even say the word, much less try to have students understand this word. Um, we were talking earlier about bringing us academic down from the clouds. That's not a, a consci con conscientization. I can't even say the word. We don't need to worry so much about the word, but I do want to give a nod to the idea that this is certainly rooted in um, one of the foremost thinkers of critical thought um, in, in academia, uh, this idea of liberal consciousness. And um, one of his greatest contributions is to upend the assumptions, um, particularly the assumptions in modern day higher, uh, higher education and in the business school that material accumulation and wealth creation are our primary goals. Um, so the scholars in the business school that have relied on Paulo Freire have really questioned this assumption um, that is pretty often explicit in business schools. Those of you who aren't in business schools, this may be kind of a, a new idea to you. Um, and so instead, we adopt this sort of definition on the bottom um, of a liberatory consciousness as, as, as a consciousness that examines power structures and the orientation of those power structures to inequities, and importantly, our complicity in these power structures, uh, because a liberatory consciousness requires action of some sort. OK? So, so this is the lens which I take. Um, and it is that lens that brings us to, if I want to understand this idea of competitive individualism, I started with understanding the um, hidden curricula of business schools. And if those of you are in the back, I'll, maybe I'll read some of this to you. Um, the hidden curricula of a school. It's not the formal curricula of students that you read on a page. The hidden curricula is the unstated norms, values, and beliefs transmitted to us all through the underlying structures of school. Norms and values usually not talked about in a teacher's statements of objectives or goals, even though those norms and values are implicitly and effectively taught in the classroom. Then you sit with that. That's the hidden curricula. This is where I argue that this notion of competitive individualism lies within the business school. It is the hidden curriculum. All right, competitive individualism. Let's dive into it now. Uh, a great scholar, I've met her a couple times, uh, uh, Pratima ben Bensal, she says, at the heart of every single course that we, we as in business professors, I actually think she's an economist, at the heart of every single course that we teach is the orientation towards profit or leadership or themselves. Themselves being, I guess, students. Um, student self-interest, I think, is what she's, she's trying to get at. Individual success, we're going to drill down a little bit on that statement. That really, that's bothersome. That's a tough statement for me to wrap my head around. And I was really naive. When I, first read, um, her, when I first heard her talk about this in person, this is a more recent publication. But she talked about this in person, and I was really naive, and I didn't want to believe it. Um, there's some studies about business students, and I just thought I'd put a couple of them up there. Um, don't worry, business students. It does not mean that you all um, are more narcissistic than your, than your friends who aren't business majors, that you have greater self-interest, that you're more selfish um, than your friends who aren't business students. It just means that in a, in a number of different studies, um, there might be a greater likelihood that you exhibit these tendencies. Doesn't necessarily mean you as an individual. This in aggregate. This is just in aggregate. I see you getting a little worried. Don't, don't get worried. Um, and then the top one is a greater value on extrinsic reward, rewards as opposed to intrinsic rewards. 
Um, that one surprised me the least. Um, often we know students go into to a business major because specifically because they want to make more money than they might from other majors. Um, sort of the embodiment of the extrinsic reward, all right? So uh, before I go to that one. All right, so now that we've talked a little bit about what competitive individualism is, I sort of conceptualize it by walking through the artifacts of this notion of competitive individualism. Um, I've got three artifacts that I'm going to talk to you all about. I want to read one, um, I guess you can't call it a, is it a quote if I wrote it? Uh, it's not published yet, so I guess it's not a quote yet. It's just what I wrote. Um, in thinking about the three different artifacts of competitive individualism, I want to tell you how I'm thinking about, I was trying to think about the most concise way that I think about this idea of competitive individualism. Okay. The foundation of traditional business school education, either implicitly or explicitly, where students are taught that their goal should be to relentlessly compete, that they should primarily pursue their own individual, uh, individual advancement on the ladder of wealth accumulation while saying very little about how our students may find their place to contribute to society, to pursue deeper purpose, or to engage in collaborative engagement to solve some of the greatest challenges facing humanity in the planet. If that doesn't sound like what you're taught here, bravo. I, I mentioned that you all might be a little different, and I, and I, I think that is the case. Um, so that's the conceptualization under which these next three topics um, help inform. So this first is the administrative production of meritocratic ideals. You can see my idea here of merit here. This isn't my definition. This is a pretty common idea of merit. And when we think about merit, um, think about the idea when you say you've earned something, right? Like I've earned this on my own merit. There are generally three uh, facets or dimensions of merit. Can anybody think about what are the things that make up merit? You just shout them out if you know them. What are the things, when you say somebody has earned it, or that's a, a meritocratic achievement, what are the things that might make up that merit? Hard work. Oh, perfect. Did I go to the wrong? Did you read the slide? Um, Hard work, okay, so um, what can we call that? Effort, all right, so one of three, effort. What's the next one? Any ideas? Good oh, good grades, um, what could we call that? Say it again. Yeah, I like that. Um, that different than, okay, I'm just, I'm just thinking about how we, yeah, I'm thinking about how to categorize some of these. Oh, achieve, ah, achievement, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but achievement is the synonym for merit, right? Achievement is the synonym for it. That might be another synonym, that's the end result, but what gets us there? Ah, natural ability, natural ability. Uh, so, if we were paid, if all of us in here were paid by the number of times over the course of five minutes we could jump up and down and touch a 10-foot rim, how many of you would be paid very well? Nobody? Okay, just a couple, of, there we go, just a couple of you. I would have been paid very well back in the day, but it's not quite the same anymore with the body. But, all right, so natural ability. Maybe height is, is related to that. Like, yeah, natural ability. So what do we have? We have effort. Uh, we have natural ability. And let me think about how I worded the third one, because I'm, I'm trying to summarize these ideas here. Um, so I summarized the third one. I don't know if this is the best word, but I was thinking about attitude is the, is the third one. Right? Attitude is the way we think about it. So we've got hard work. We've got natural ability. We've got attitude. The ideas that, that make up merit um, in our attitude. I wanted to, again, this time I printed my, my quote. <laughs> um, I thought this was too important to try to, to summarize, and I wanted you all to, to actually read this, and I could um, maybe say it out loud to you all. When we rely on merit, this is the implicit idea that the, the divide in the world between the haves and the have-nots 
is a function of our talent and our work ethic. Those with the talents deserve the benefits we provide to them, while those without those talents just need to work harder. The unhoused in our society, they don't have the talent. They haven't worked hard. People struggling to make you know, rent. Family may ask you to borrow some money. Uh, just you know, exhibit more merit. Right? This is the implicit idea that we ingrain into students, particularly relentlessly in business schools, I make the argument. So I'm giving you the high level of, um, uh, of this argument. And I sort of summarize it um, in, the, in the following ways. And this, is a, this top quote is from Michael Sandel. Um, and Michael Sandel is trying to convey a similar message that we are not self-made or self-sufficient. Indeed, we exist in a society that prizes our talents um, in a society that prizes our talents that are good fortune, not necessarily our due. And when he says our due, not necessarily something we deserve or earned, but that are a function of our good fortune. So my final sort of summary statement that when I, when I build this argument in the paper is that the more we, we view students' success as their own talent and hard work, the greater divide exists. Right, the less those students find commonality um, with the students around them who do not find success, such success, maybe even looking down on them. And I see that particularly insidious effect in business schools. Those who haven't earned the scholarship, those who aren't in the prestigious business societies, they haven't worked as hard as me. I earned the scholarship. Nothing to say of the fact that I don't have to work 40 hours a week like some of my classmates who don't have the privilege I have to come for money. Again, I'm saying these are general ideas. Not everybody thinks this way. But it's the argument I build up towards um, uh, the hidden curriculum of business schools. OK, the next of these artifacts, the next of these um, artifacts that reinforce competitive individualism is this idea of teaching practices and norms. Now, uh, for time, we can go to some of these in the Q&A. I wanted to, you know, I've already talked a little bit about individual level responses to well-being challenges. And, and I thought maybe um, I would just give uh, one mention of punitive pedagogy before moving on to the next one. And if, if you wanted to talk more about this particular um, slide, you know, we could, we could go back in the Q&A. So punitive pedagogy. I've just been blown away, and in three different business schools so far, at the level of punitiveness that exists in our classrooms, on our syllabi, and the lack of compassion and care. And it's sort of in the name of welcome to the real world. Um, but the irony of demanding that our students submit everything by a deadline lest they lose 20% of the points, and we relentlessly tell them how um, unprofessional and irresponsible they are. The irony behind that is that when's the last time us academics have not asked for an extension from a journal editor? Because we can't meet a deadline. Raise your hand, faculty, uh, if you've been behind in grading in the past year, ever. I'm super behind right now. So, I mean, should students, um, should they take this out on me punitively in the, in the ratings? Well, they won't because I've gone to a lot of sessions uh, on pedagogy and I know that uh, recency bias is a great way to inflate student ratings. So at the end of the semester, I do something really, really nice for them so that the <laughs> student ratings go up, bring my dog in right at the end of the class because I know that helps boost my ratings. Um, so this is my idea of, of punitive pedagogy, right? So this is where I'm going with this idea of punitive pedagogy that, that really, really, again, enforces this idea of individualism. OK, but what I want to spend the rest of the time on is this third pillar, this third artifact um, of competitive individualism. And that's curricular commitments uh, to self-interest and material accumulation. OK, I'm not the first one to talk about the harmful business theories, the harmful business practices. A lot of people have done that. Um, I won't go too much into that, 
But what I will do is give you a couple examples, in particular, of our curriculum that I argue helps perpetuate these harmful ideas. Um, shareholder value ideology and the commodification of DNI. Again, I say DNI a bit broadly. Um, we'll talk maybe about what I mean uh, when we get to that one. So um, this idea of shareholder value ideology, I would say that Lynn Stout, uh, one of my uh, late colleagues, Lynn Stout, um, said this best in her book, The Shareholder Value Myth. And um, this is the prevailing idea that businesses, in particular, ought to be concerned primarily and overwhelmingly with not just profit, but maximizing profit in the near term, as quickly as possible. Taken to its logical extreme, which is what we often do, we teach students that every single business decision they make, no matter what level of the organization they're in, must be towards maximizing profits because shareholders, owners, and profit are the only things that matter. Those are the most important things. If we're not making, um, the, the best example that my students and I often talk about is when a public company is not making its um, uh, quarterly earnings expectations, and this is indeed often more frequent than quarterly now because the short-term expectation is often even sooner than that. If they're not making their, their quarterly earnings statement, what's the first thing that businesses think to do? Lay off people. Because what's the most important thing? Not employment in an economy, not the well-being of, of people's lives in a community, but making some arbitrary line of, of, of revenue generation. Nothing fundamentally changes about the company other than the fact that maybe we could say we made an, uh, another $500,000 by laying off X number of people. This is the best cartoon that I've found to summarize shareholder value ideology. If you can't read it, it's um, some people sitting around a campfire, presumably at the end times, and said, yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. Right? So usually I bring this in um, when we're talking a lot about environmental sustainability. Uh, you know, gas was really cheap again for me for a little while, but at what expense, right? What communities did we destroy? How quickly are we destroying the ozone, right? It's these sorts of conversations that, that um, we lead to, uh, uh, my students will lead me to when discussing shareholder value ideology. Uh, let's see. Okay. Here's an example in an organizational behavior book. Um, students, anybody taking uh, a class called organizational behavior? Everybody. Cool. All right. Do you use the OpenStax? Don't answer that. Um, this is the, from the OpenStax publicly available free online textbook on organizational behavior. This is the most widely used free textbook, not only across the world, but across the nation, for organizational behavior. This is an ethical decision-making tree. When making a decision, what is the first? OK, well, the first thing is legal, sorry. What is the second? thing you need to worry about, whether that decision makes the most money possible for shareholders. That is the second most important thing you should think about when making an ethical decision. I don't really know what to say to that. I, uh, I mean, as my ethics training is just like Shivering, and I, hopefully all of my business ethics students in here, hopefully this is just eating at you as well. And then we see here towards the end, um, again, disclosing action to shareholders is the most important thing you should do um, if, you, if you, you know, make decisions along this, along this tree. Uh, now here is a statement in a, in a popular textbook. I don't know... Um, the numbers quite yet on this one as I've been collecting all of the, the different textbooks um, and, and looking at these statements, I kind of got them a bit mixed up. So I, I had some wrong data up here. So I think this is the second most popular intro to finance, uh, or um, like an intro to finance course. Uh, but I could, I could be wrong about that one, so don't hold me to that one. Um, but again, they talk about the, uh, on, in publicly owned companies, 
their primary goal, the primary goal of a business, shareholder wealth maximization. That is what a company exists to do, not to improve society by any measurable outcome, not to create employment, not to create products and services that the world needs just to make the most money possible. That's what they exist to do. This is what I talk about by competitive individualism. If we teach students that that is what the world is about, well, then no wonder that is what they do when they go out into the real world. Relentlessly compete, relentlessly strive to make the most money possible. Um, humans be damned. All right, now a second part of this um, curricular commitment to uh, competitive individualism. We have uh, the commodification of DNI. And so I talk about it not only in the curriculum, but also in business school values and DNI statements. So we'll, we'll kind of go through, we'll kind of go through both. Okay, so now this is the most popular strategy textbook. Hit Ireland and Hoskinson, very well known. Intro to, oh no, not intro, it's usually a capstone strategic management course um, that most business students take. And usually students take this as a senior, sort of like a culminating course. I don't know if this exists in the same way here or not. We can talk about that later. Um, but you see here, this is the um, probably the most robust mention of diversity that the entire book has. And they say that the ethnic diversity of a population is important not only because of consumer needs, but also because of the labor force composition. Interestingly, research has shown that firms with greater ethnic diversity are likely to enjoy higher firm performance. Well, what is firm performance? Maximization, shareholder value. Two things in this. When I say commodification of DNI, it means it becomes a thing to be leveraged to profit. It's just another variable in the equation to make money. If we plug and play three more black people here, another woman here, what if we put a Muslim here? Will it make us more money? That's what it's been reduced to. Consumer needs making a company more profit. Here's a, a principle of marketing textbook. And the only place I could find DNI was within this section on changing consumer demographics. This is the intro to marketing. The intro to marketing. Hopefully people realize the impact that marketing has on our society. It is marketers that created, uh, let's see, raise your hand if you remember this campaign that um, was it H&M had when they had a, a virtual ad. Oh, I see a couple of heads already. They had a virtual ad where they had a little black boy in a shirt that said, coolest monkey on the planet. Ah, I see how, heads nodding. I think it might have been also, no, H&M or somebody else that had a turtleneck with huge lips that a black woman was wearing on, on, online. It's the marketing teams that are responsible for these incredibly harmful perpetuation of stereotypes. And we see students' introduction to this idea of marketing. The only reason DNI matters is here for its instrumental capacity, for its ability to be leveraged for profit. I'll read this for those who can't see it. Another attractive diversity segment is the 53 million US adults with disabilities, a market larger than African Americans or Hispanics, representing anywhere from 200 to 500 billion. Most individuals with disabilities are active consumers. For example, one study found that the segment spends 17 billion on 73 million business and leisure trips every year, and people with disabilities typically travel with one or more other adults. The economic impact is estimated to be at least double that amount. This is virtually the only mention of DNI in the book is references like this. How can we leverage these different demographic groups for greater profit? Not how can we create a greater world through upending stereotypes with our harmful marketing practices? How can marketing be harnessed to change stereotypes? How can marketing be harnessed for good with regard to DNI? That's not in there. I have yet to find a mainstream marketing textbook that that is in there. 
Okay, so that gives you an idea of how this appears in, um, how DNI appears in textbooks. I wanted to show you now how it appears on um, not just websites. This is business school explicit formal commitments to DNI, we might call them. So I have this all appear anonymously. Don't worry, none of it is W and L. Um, these are all these are three different business schools, and I'll give you a chance to read them, and then maybe by show of hands we'll see which one you like, which ones you like. Okay, so let's look at the first. This is their DNI statement at this first business school. They say we foster an environment based on mutual respect, uh, one that broadens understanding and builds trust. Show of hands, anybody like this one? What does that have to do with DNI? That's, uh, yeah, I see, yeah, I see somebody nodding there. This is a positive culture, right? Like this could just be on WNL's um, website for like its, its culture, like what it hopes to be. This, doesn't say anything about DNI. All right, now we've got the, the second one here. Um, this, this business school is committed to fostering a diverse, inclusive community that encourages all people to reach their full potential through learning, working, and service by enhancing and sustaining an ethical, culturally grounded, and anti racist institution. We will equip the leaders of tomorrow to live the values of business as a force for good. That's better. That's better. Um, I, anybody want to go out on a limb and give it a critique? I'm asking a lot of you, so I don't expect it, but that's a, I, I'm thinking on your feet, right, you know, right as I say it. But just in case anybody wants to, I'm going to come back to it. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll repeat what you say. I like it. It's, it's certainly rooted in merit. Um, so, so this um, person here said that a lot of it is still rooted on you fulfilling potential. And if you don't, it's sort of like your own fault. A lot of this is certainly rooted in merit. And again, very instrumental, right? Like we, we believe in diversity um, because it will help our students get better, right? It's very instrumental. This is rooted in the argument that um, for a student population like WNL, more black, Latino, and Asian students is good for all of your learning because as a lot of institutions that are overwhelmingly white, you get access to uh, greater um, cultural competence and, and your, your cultural exposure will make you a better person, right? So again, it's very instrumental. It doesn't make it bad, but again, it's very instrumental. How can DNI help me? All right, the third one, our community celebrates diversity as a source of strength, welcomes different backgrounds, opinions, and experiences, we welcome new ideas and perspectives along with vigorous debate to learn from each other. As we develop a better understanding and appreciation of our differences, we can reach our full potential. Very similar. What I didn't show you with these two is that both of these schools also write that we are committed to anti-racism and racial justice. These are, I, I would argue, maybe incompatible with these ideas because if DNI is instrumental, then you're not interested in racial justice. We can, we'll come to kind of what that might mean in a, in a, in a second. Um, because I would argue that a genuine commitment to DNI, if DNI is about racial justice, that has to be an outright repudiation of these notions of um, competitive individualism. Here's another one that I found for a uni uh, not a university, a business school that also commits itself to this idea of uh, reparative justice for historically marginalized populations. It explicitly commits to that and then wrote this. We prioritize uh, DE&I in our classrooms and workplace to help our students, faculty, and staff thrive and succeed. We commit ourselves to the continual iterative process of removing systemic roadblocks in higher education. So what they go on to explain is that they are complicit in the current state of higher education that still and historically has disadvantaged a vast majority of people in this country and in this world, particularly those who identify as black, Latino, Native American, and often Asian population. 
So they go on to explain, because of our complicity, we're committed to doing X, Y, and Z. That's racial justice. Yeah, they have a bit of instrumentality, but it's couched within this larger project of racial justice. So this is what I mean by DNI's racial justice. I'll let you read. Um, I tried to summarize my own conceptualization, and then I, um, this would not be very interesting for me to um, conceptualize for you all. So I just tried to summarize my own idea of, of how a business academy might commit to racial justice. There are three components then to, to a, a business school that, must, that is committing to racial justice. The first component is to look back. How has our school been complicit in harms that exist today? What have we done that have created current conditions? So I came, I, I'm, I'm a currently employed at College of Charleston. Well, I mean, the entire campus was built by enslaved people. Well, the big donors, the money that we get at the school, not just the business school, comes from people who, have, who built those fortunes on pretty large exploitation of, of a lot of populations in this country and across the world. How are we complicit in that? How do we use that money? How do we use our space? How do we indemnify, that is, make whole those populations we've harmed? That's looking back. The second one is looking inward. That's the one we all understand well. Business schools talk about it you know, pretty well. That's looking inside. That's about um, inclusiveness. That's about belonging. How do we make it a place um, where someone like me, a black professor, who is one of four, I think, black faculty, in a pretty big school of business. I think I'm one of four. How do you create a place where I feel like I belong, I feel um, included, and I want to participate, I feel good walking down the halls, those sorts of things, right? So we understand the looking in. And the third one is looking forward. How do we advocate, how do we teach, and how do we create business models that create a more equitable world going forward? How do we produce marketing students that do more than just don't produce harmful marketing ads, but instead create transformative marketing projects that move us towards a more equitable and just society, a more beneficent mutuality, if you will. How do we create business models that do that? So that's the idea of sort of racial justice that I build to. Now, how this happens in my classroom I thought would be really helpful, maybe even for, for students to think about. Um, I talked a little bit about how I build to this idea to fight against competitive individualism in my research. How I do it in the classroom, um, I, I take a number of different routes to do that. Maybe the most, um, maybe my favorite, the most prolific is art as a learning tool. So I talked about this at the beginning. Um, I think I put it, yeah, here's an example. So, uh, might know who this is, shout it out. All right, Malcolm X, all right, good. Um, we know that. A student made this for me. This is a four by four feet, um, huge, heavy piece of wood created with a CNC machine, Com computer, numerical, something. It's like the opposite of um, 3D printing. So it's cutting into this wood. This is engraved in this wood through a, a big machine that it ran through, and then she whittled it out and, um, and painted it um, black in that way. And so this is huge, and it's in my house. It's hanging in my house. And she made this in a class where we, I asked students to do, to do two things, and that is to first imagine themselves going into an, um, an HR office looking for a job. And in their left hand, they hold their resume. And they say, um, and they say what with a resume? Shout it out. What are, what are the things that your resume tells an employer? Qualifications, give me um, like specific. GPA, the school you went to. What else? What kind of work experience you have? What other things might a resume tell you? Interest, maybe you um, volunteer on the weekends, or you like to play basketball. It could be superficial or, or deeper. Sometimes they tell you, uh, tell an employer where you live, but students take that off. Take your address off your resume. You don't need that on there. 
Skills. Students love to put proficient with PowerPoint on there. Um, you can probably take that off as well, but that, listen to your professors, not me. Um, okay, one or two, I'm thinking of one thing. What else does your resume tell? Anything else I'm missing? I'm thinking about one thing. I'm thinking like a really obvious thing about it. Your name, yeah, that's a great one. I love that, I love that. That's what you're gonna say, name. Yeah, your name, that, that's it, your name. Which tells you a lot about somebody, tells you a lot about somebody. As a quick digression, whether I showed up here as Oscar Stewart or whether I show up here as Jerome Stewart, that tells you something in your mind very differently about me. Showing up here as Oscar Jerome Stewart might have told you something. Just Jerome, uh, maybe, maybe not the students, right? You might have grown up in an era where, or, where it might not be so prolific. Um, but for faculty and staff, as Jerome Stewart, you probably expected a black man to show up. As Oscar Stewart, you might have been less sure. But we create stereotypes, so names tell us a lot. All right, what do you not show that HR recruiter with your resume? What are you missing? What, I'm sorry, what is that HR recruiter missing about you? Your values. Like anything substantial about what it is you bring to the workplace. So that's what I ask students to create, a work of art that they can hold in this right hand and walk into an HR recruiter's office and plop down and say, this is part, not all, this is part of my values, this is part of who I am, this is part of what makes me tick. And so this student is gonna walk <laughs> into an office with Malcolm X. That's gonna say a lot. I said, so let's talk about that. Before you actually do that, I you know, talk to you a little bit uh, about, <laughs> about that. Um, make sure you know, you're going with the right attitude. But, uh, what students produce is a range of amazing art uh, projects. One of my favorites was a pair of hands. Um, I didn't put it up here because I actually rem I couldn't get a hold of the student to get her permission. So I didn't put it up here. I didn't want to you know, violate that trust. But it's a pair of hands that are painted as two mountains. And the two mountains are coming together like this. And the peaks are kind of the the, the, palm, uh, the, the palm, where the thumb kind of meets your wrist, that's sort of the peaks of the mountain. And you see the hands coming together, but you can't really tell it's hands until you look at it carefully. And she said she, she painted this because her idea is that she's going into a recruiter's office with a strong sense of who she is, and that's a compromiser, that's somebody who brings others together. She's a uniter. She solves conflicts, she brings friends together, she includes people who are not included. That's what she does. That is what she aspires to be. So that's my idea of art as a way to disrupt this competitive individualism. Now, another reason why it does that is because I work on these together. There's no competition. If you're awesome with art and I'm terrible, maybe you could help me with that art. You can give me ideas with the art. There's no grade. There's no competition. There's no curve on this. There's no A, there's no B, there's no C. You just get the points for spending the time to think deeply about who you are. That's learning, if I've ever seen it. So students spend a lot of time on this assignment um, and, do it, and do it really, really well. Okay. Um, I think one more thing before I go to a final contemplation. I think what we might talk a little bit about in the Q&A, if, if you all want to, um, is thinking a little bit about this radical change and the two ways that I'm really honing in on it in my own work um, is this idea of humanistic management and this is the idea that's spreading across disciplines in, in the business school. That's the idea that centers human dignity um, as a foundation of work. Not just like a business organization, but just centers human dignity as our goal. Nothing to do with profit, our goal as professors, is to help teach students how to add to human flourishing in this world. That's sort of the goal of human, uh, humanistic management. And then the second point I have here, interdisciplinarity. This is my training. From what I'm learning from you all, this is WNL's my, uh, mantra, mantra, mantra. This is WNL's mantra, interdisciplinarity. 
to the extent that we can get business schools out of their silos and involved with the rest of the university, I think it's going to be really hard to cling to this idea of competitive individualism. It's going to be really hard to cling to What if business schools had to exist with sociology? It's going to be really hard to exist in that space when you're in a, a, a business meeting with a sociologist, when a sociologist is on your tenure committee as faculty, and when a sociologist is helping maybe to teach um, uh, an intro to management or a strategy course. Right? So these are sort of my ideas that I write about as ways to overcome. I just really like this quote. I won't read it to you. Just let you read it. Again, I, I wanted to end. Um, I appreciate Carla. That you did a, a really you did something more than a land acknowledgement. You made a, a bit of a like a what we might call a statement of repertory justice, right? We, we've often talked in academia of the inadequacy of a land acknowledgement, and so this slide was my sort of gateway to do uh, a bit of what Carla did. Carla did you did it much better than I could have done it um, of doing more than a land acknowledgement, but a sort of a statement of, of reparative justice, the beginnings of that. So again, I, I end here to recenter us on the idea of reimagining society and to center back on this idea of compassion and love. This is what these two animals signal to me, compassion and love, uh, and I can't wait to see them again tomorrow. Thank you all. Do you have the, the microphone, or is it up? Oh, you have it over there. So we have time for some questions. We've got mics on both sides of the room today, which will really help. Uh, if you have a question for Professor Stewart, raise your hand, and I'll get the mic to you. Hi, thanks very much. Um, I teach politics here uh, at the university. Um, and the, the question I have is a bit of a downer, but isn't the sort of the logic of efficiency and, and profit uh, something that exists at kind of the macroeconomic level? Uh, it, it's, it's tied to the tragedy of the commons and uh, the inability uh, for efficiency-seeking organizations to solve uh, the uh, common good problems. Uh, it's, it's a large structural dilemma that we face when wanting to do good uh, is inconvenient, inefficient, or unprofitable. So simply willing away uh, the, the overriding logic of, of capitalism um, uh, is, is something maybe a lot of us would do, but when faced with whether at the individual level, choices between doing things that are going to make more money or or be more efficient versus making large ethical choices that might fit some higher ethical goal. Um, I would say at the individual level and the societal level as a whole, we just don't see that. So how do you square that dilemma, which is that it's not efficient, it's not profitable, and it's not convenient to do the right thing in, in many cases where we wish it, wish it was? Yeah, that is the central question. That's the central question. This is what critical business scholars ask. The more, um, the adherence to shareholder value ad ideology would ask the same questions, but in a more, um, from the other lens, right? They would say you're foregoing efficiency and profit and society will crumble if you, if you don't conform to this logic. So, I'm used to this question, and this is a, a central conversation I have often. Again, I just bring us right back here of imagining new possibilities. It's really tough, but I, I do it on a weekly with my students 
we highlight examples of where this does happen already. We have plenty of examples and pockets of where this happens. Sure, it happens within um, some pockets of capitalist endeavors. We've got our, our favorite example. I'm sure you all use this example in your class of Patagonia. Um, but Patagonia and Costco make decisions all the time that don't maximize profit and are inefficient. They also pair that with decisions that contradict what I just said as well. right? So they pair those. Uh, uh, on one hand, Costco might make an inefficient, unprofitable decision to pay their employees really, really well. But then on the other hand, they might make a really shareholder value ideology minded decision in their supply chain to really squeeze their suppliers um, for every ounce of profit they can so that they can pay their employees more. Right? So, so we have a bit of hypocrisy. But there certainly are small bits of organizations that do that. And I try to highlight them in my class. But we also highlight different models and different ways of imagining. If you cannot imagine a political and economic system that doesn't exploit humans in the world as its primary overarching function, right, then it will never happen. So we have to imagine what new age cooperative organizations look like. We have to imagine a world where B corporations exist in, in a greater numbers and whether or not that is a route forward. Not for profit organizations. We have to think about whether or not cooperatives can scale up and become a more uh, central, central business model. Uh, and so we think about these possibilities every single week. We think about these possibilities every single week. Every, every student, every paper I write, every topic we talk about, there's always new ideas. There are always possibilities where students make me think differently. Students highlight examples that exist, little pockets of human flourishing at the behest of a for-profit organization. So yeah, I think it's difficult. I don't think it exists in mass. And yeah, maybe I'm still living pretty naively. But the only alternative is that we resign ourselves to killing the planet and ourselves. So we've got to imagine a world where there is an economic and political system that can exist. We have corporate charters that are not focused on profit maximization, that are instead focused on the well-being of other stakeholders. We have models where it exists. It's just not prevalent. I had a question. It seemed like um, the, the art pedagogy was really helped students to expand their thinking more broadly about their own goals and values and also maybe about the business world more broadly. What do you think is the active ingredient there? What is it about art making that allows that to happen? Oh, that's a good question. I thought about that. You might, um, you might have an answer in mind you could tell me too. So I'm thinking, um, let me back up. I also do a photography project. So if any of these diversity students are, are listening on the live stream, my diversity students, so what they're going to be doing in two weeks um, is that we're going to have an art gallery in class where students have collected a series of photographs that capture Jedi in action. Jedi is justice, equity, diversity, inclusion. Jedi in action, something positive, something not so positive. So this might range from um, a set of pictures that capture accessible workplaces around Charleston, um, accessible for people with wheelchairs, accessible um, for, for blind patrons, accessible for, uh, let's see, any sort, sort of, of person with a disability might have trouble getting into. How does this, this organization address that? Um, I've had students create a series of photographs for this project uh, that capture fat shaming in retail. They go around, students have gone around to different retailers and captured the mannequins and the size offerings in these small boutiques to show how stores are and are not size inclusive and how that matters for us as a society. So, okay, now circle back to Carla's question. What they take from that is an intense feeling of ownership over this. This is their art, whether it's the, the Malcolm X um, uh, woodworking, whether it's the drawing with the mountain, or whether it's a series of, of photos that they've taken the time to collect. They just have such ownership over it even if the drawing is horrible, there's a lot of bad art. <laughs> but mine is, like, mine is terrible. Like, you still get an A because your idea is awesome and your creativity is awesome, and they own it. So I think that's the key with the students is that they're really proud of this. And I'll be like, hey, can I have that? 
afterwards? I'm like, no, I'm keep, you know, most of them don't want me to have it because they have a sense of ownership over that. And they also, in that art gallery, they have to sit there for an hour and explain to everybody, from me, to their classmates, to the provost, uh, maybe one day the president, I'm gonna invite the president this semester, we'll see. A lot of people show up. They have to explain what's happening here and answer questions. And I tell all the faculty and staff, throw them a lot of questions. Why is this idea important? What do you mean accessibility? What's that mean? Equity, what are you talking about? This is more equitable. What does that word mean? So they have to really take ownership and I think that's where the learning comes uh, because they really enjoy and spend a lot of time on this. Hi, I'm a professor from the law school and I do a lot of, um, my writings are in therapeutic jurisprudence. So a lot of these ideas are very similar. Looking at um, the effects, the emotional effects that the processes and, and procedures and uh, laws have on all the players in the system yeah. and how that can influence us to change it so that it better meets the actual um, desires of those processes. Is that I don't understand the question. Tell me so more. I'm just saying that yeah, it's very, it, it has a lot of the same ideas that I think you're talking about here, although not in business schools and not in businesses. I see what you, but, oh, I mean, I you're just pointing out the goal, okay, okay, But okay. It's, 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 um, it's similar and it's exciting to see how there can be, there can be changes and have like had that. changes to the like systems. That. I, that, that warms my heart to see that there are similar efforts. Um, yeah, law schools have their own set of, of yes. challenges with competitive individualism. I, I suspect the artifacts Absolutely. are very different, right? Um, <sighs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of that. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, that to some extent is changing also, to, yeah. or has over the last 40 years. As our assumptions around what the criminal legal system is and should be, as all that changes. Well, and, and yeah, and, and the schooling too, right? School, schooling in law schools now is different than it was when I was in law school. And not everybody, but there is a lot more um, recognition of the tensions and, and um, non-wellness aspects of how we've taught law school and that that should be changed. The ideas of um, when I was in law school, a lot of schools had one final for the whole year. And that was mm -hmm. like your grade for the entire year. I mean, it was crazy. It was, a it was horrible model of learning. Yeah, yeah. And so now there's more, it's still for most uh, doctrinal classes, it's still more of there's one final for the semester, but at least it's just a semester. But more and more people are having midterms or, um, other kinds of activities that great, get graded. So it's not uh, just, you know, if you mess up in one, ca in one, in uh, one course in your first year, you know, you've like lost it. Yeah, it think, is, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was gonna say, well, I think what you're talking about is a greater emphasis on understanding how adults learn, mm -hmm. we're getting better at that across disciplines, right? Like business school and law school, I suspect, similarly are very well behind the curve. Like, like education, uh, for example, is, is far more uh, progressive or up to date with, with the ways that we learn. So law schools are getting better. I just was gonna say, I think you've planted a lot of good seeds for all of us to think about how this translates into the fields that we are more specifically embedded in. Um, and I know if folks are interested in the legal field and want to um, continue thinking about Professor Stewart's ideas with reference to that in particular, um, the Mud Center is, uh, one of the Mud Center lectures in the winter will be by Seema Gajwani, who does restorative justice work um, and really, really interrogates that. Like, to what degree does the adversarial legal system really just reinforce everything that we shouldn't want it to? Um, so keep, if you're interested in the legal field, you will definitely want to 
I want to attend that lecture. But meanwhile, I think our time is up for today. So Professor Stewart, thank you so much for planting such good seeds. Thank you all.